Good afternoon, viewers, and very warm welcome to the tenth episode of the Meet the Media Veteran series. Today, in the episode, we have a national award-winning filmmaker, archivist, and restorer who passionately believes in the cause of film preservation and restoration, and he has taken film preservation as a mission. So, before presenting his full introduction, may I first welcome the renowned filmmaker. Film preservation is an archive. Mr. Shivan Singh Dugar put to the show. Thank you, Prithvanji. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Shivanji, for joining us today. Shivan Singh Dugar put is the founder director of Film Heritage Foundation and is an award-winning filmmaker, archivist, and restorer who passionately believes in the cause of film preservation and restoration, and is a uniquely qualified to head the foundation. His first documentary, Celluloid Man. Pays tribute to the India's legendary archivist, Mr. P. K. Nair, while celebrating the history of Indian cinema and making a fervent plea for its preservation and restoration. His second documentary, The Immortals, told the story of Indian cinema through the visual exploration of physical artifacts, persons, spaces, and living memoirs. Shivend has collected on two world-class restoration projects with none other than Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Foundation. Uday Shankar's classic film Kalpana, and eminent Sri Lankan filmmaker Dr. Lester James Perry's film Nidhania, that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2012 and Venice Film Festival in 2013. He was a donor for the restoration of Hitchcock's silent film The Lodger, that was done by the British Film Institute. He has been invited to be the, to be a member of the artistic committee of the Cinema Retrovoto. Film festival in Bologna that includes, amongst others, the legends like Alexander Pinet, Telema School maker Jonathan Rosenbaum, John Doshid, Aki Aki Korosmaki, Peter Baker, and Kevin Brownlow. He is also a member of the honorary committee of the Nitrate Picture Show George Eastman House's Festival of Film Conservation. In 2017, Shivendra was elected to the executive committee of FIAP. At 2017 FIAP Congress hosted by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. In 2018, Shivendra completed his third documentary on renowned Czech filmmaker Jiri Manjil and the Czech New Wave. He has also directed and produced over 600 commercials, short films, documentaries under the banner of Dunger Foot Films, one of the most reputed production houses in the country. May I now invite Mr. Shivan Singh Dugar Pur to kindly deliver his talk on Indian film heritage? Thank you, Ritwan. Well, I think when we talk about Indian film heritage, especially in today's context, uh, when we are going through one of the major crises, uh, the pandemic, as we are seeing today, and I think. It's very important that we make it relevant to today what is happening, uh, because pandemic is going to have a huge impact on all archives, all museums, not only in India but all over the world, and primarily most of the money which used to get streamlined for arts and culture is suddenly going to take a back seat. And and you will see that many many uh, archives and museums will find it very difficult to survive the pandemic. Uh, survive the whole idea of physically going and seeing a museum. To me, there is nothing more important than to visit a museum, to visit an archive. To physically see the object, physically see a painting, uh, or physically see an artifact, it is the same way when you are in a movie theater and you enjoy the experience of watching a film. Because watching a film is a community-driven exercise. It's it's you meet your friends, you you eat popcorns, you share the experience of of watching a film. You, you, there is a There is this great feeling that during Ramzan you you share your food. Uh, to me, filmmaking is like a Ramzan. You know, uh, film watching is like a Ramzan. That you you come together, you share your food, you celebrate the occasion. 
uh, films cannot be watched uh, sitting back at home. They were not made or they were not created. Uh, I mean, when the early cinema or Chaplin created these movements and the whole idea of uh, saving this heritage was precisely that, so that it is available to the generations to come after us uh, to be able to experience that that sort of feeling and experience the the excitement of watching the film. Now, when we look at India's cinematic heritage, uh, we are looking at uh, something like nearly ten film industries. You know, we produce about 2,000 films a year, approximately. Um, and we have something like 36 languages and so many dialects uh, that there are certain languages people wouldn't have heard of also. So just imagine that over the period of time since we became the largest producing filmmaking nation, how difficult it is to preserve this vast heritage um, and, and in what ways we can preserve it. And the National Film Archive in Pune, which was created in 1964, was the first institution which was built by the government under the leadership of P.K. Nair. The primary goal of that archive was to preserve films. Uh, and, and they would invariably come in the form of films which were shown at the national awards, or which used to come for censor, those films were then sent off to uh, the NFAI and was preserved. Now, when NFAI was started in 64, the statistics clearly show that we had lost nearly 70 to 80 percent of our heritage by then. If you really look at the, the era of silent films, you know, it's interesting when people say silent films, because films were never silent. Even in the silent era, uh, you had a musician playing music uh, in the theatres. You know, every cinema hall will have different musicians and different set of people. And it depended on you, because if I'm running a cinema hall, I'll, I'll have three musicians, harmonium uh, and a percussionist or, or, or whatever. I could, I could gather what I could afford at the cinema hall. And notations would come from a filmmaker, and then you would you would adapt that. So films were never silent. We call it silent because there was no talking in the film. But but as a film medium, there was always uh, somebody playing music. And if you look at the statistics, we have lost nearly ninety nine percent of our silent films. Some twenty twenty five fragments are left. Five or six nearly complete films are left. Uh, so much so that the early films were made uh, by a component called nitrate. And, you know, if you see film reel, uh, which you many of you would have not seen, but in the olden days, as I would call it, everything was shot on film till 2014. Right. 2014 is the really the exist, exists zit, I would call it, of uh, of where the censor board says 2014 was the last few films they censored. Uh, so if you look at that, the early films before 1951 was made on nitrate. And nitrate was very highly flammable, you know, it used to catch fire. So much so that there's a controversy with Raja Harish Chandra. The first ever film, feature film, made by Dada Saab Falke in 1930. And what really happened in that film is, it's, it's a four reel film, but we only have the first and the last reel. We have lost the second and the third reel. But, but a lot of controversy was around that. And I remember sitting with P.K. Nair, and Nair Saab used to say that, you know, Shivend, this is not the 1913 version. And I said, how do you say that? And it was very interesting because he said, he showed me the film, but I'll come to that story. But 
But what really happened to the 1930 version was that Falke used to take the films on his bullet cart because the film was shot in Nasik. And as you know that at Nasik uh, was really the home of where the early cinema started. Uh, it started of course from Dadar uh, where Falke used to stay and then it went on to Nasik. And then in Kolhapur, we had Baburao Painter coming up later, who was inspired by the work of Falke and who began his studio uh, and started working films. But it was never the seat belt of Hindu films. It was always the Marathi because Falke would also direct in Marathi. So in, in one of his bullock cart rides, because it was hot, like what we are facing today in, in, in India, in the month of May, we are end of May and coming into June, it's really, really hot. Some places are over 45 degrees and and he was carrying this film in his bullet cart and it caught fire because it was made of nitrate. And uh, he had, he was forced to reshoot his entire film. And in his first version, 1913, there were men acting as women because there were no women ready to do those roles. And you had one of the cooks. A Salunke, who was, uh, you know, Falke writes that he saw him in a restaurant and he had very feminine features and he casted him in the film. And uh, that became the first ever film, uh, which, which, 1930. But the version which we have uh, has a few women in the film. And, and that's why Nair Saab, through his diaries and things, could figure out that probably the version we have uh, is, is not the 1913, but the 1918 version. And that also we have only two days. But what was sad was that, that the early filmmakers never thought of preserving any bit of it. That's why we lost 99% of the films. And then 1931, the first talkie came in. And uh, which was Alamara. And it was such an important film because it was the first talkie made by Adashir Radani. It had stalwarts like Prithviraj Kapoor, Master Vithal, uh, Zubeda, W.M. Khan, who sang the first song, Dede Khuda Ke Naam. But nothing remained of that film because that film also sort of uh, was sold off because a lot of viewers will not know nitrate has a large component of silver. So they were sold for silver extraction. And when color films came, they were sold for, for bangles because you know, with the dye, you could make bangles. So when I used to meet a lot of what was called silver scavengers, they would talk about um, the fact that, that to remove 50 odd films, you would get three kgs of silver. So you can imagine how many films they must have ripped through to get just a few kgs of silver. So we lost Alamara. Uh, so if you really look at the early history, very till 1950 and 1960, uh, there were a lot of fires of nitrate. There was, there was, we lost Alamara. We lost the early silent films. And in 51, a new stock came out, which all the filmmakers started using, which was called celluloid acetate, acetate film, which was also called safety film. It was called safety because it was safer than the nitrate. Right. But, you know, you had a huge problem with safety films because they smelled if they were not kept in proper air conditioning and proper humidifier. Uh, it was smelling of vinegar syndrome. It was smell like vinegar. Uh, many of you who have your own Super 8 or 8 mm films of your fathers or grandfathers, you would have witnessed this smell coming out of your cupboards or your your go downs or your store rooms or wherever, and you would suddenly find a whole lot of films which would be the advent of celluloid acetate. Now, one of the key issues when dealing with with filmmaking in India was that that was it just the fact that they were made in nitrate, the reason for a lot of films disappearing. That was not the case. Uh, you know, the, the Indian film industry came uh, 
or it grew out of three port cities, Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. They were the three biggest centers of filmmaking. Um, Madras, because Madras was the center for filmmaking for the Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada. Calcutta became, in a very interesting way, the home for the Hindi films, because one should not forget that the seat of the British government was in Calcutta. That's why you have the Victoria Memorial. You have, you have a man called J.F. Madden, who was a Parsi, who traveled all the way from Mumbai to Calcutta to start what is called Madden Theatres, the first important exhibitionist in India, uh, who built about 120 odd theatres, not only in India, but Sri Lanka, Burma, uh, wherever his regions came. And he also built the first cinema. And Bombay became really the seat for the Marathi films. Uh, when I say Marathi, like what I said, the silent films were, never had a language. But when the films were released here, they were directed with a Marathi overtone. But when they were released, the intertitles will have a Gujarati and an English. Um, and, uh, and by intertitles, I mean, if you all have seen a Chapman film or, a, or an early film, you will see suddenly uh, after a scene, you will see a reaction or you'll see a dialogue written on a black screen and it will come. And, and that was the intertitles, which were, which was common thread where the whole hall will be silent and suddenly the intertitle will come and everybody will start reading and you will hear the murmur of people reading, you know, and it, it was fascinating. I think how film was perceived in the dark room with the rays of light and, and, and the way they were able to watch films. So the filmmaking started in these port cities. And I think most of the producers never really thought that they had the, they, they thought of that till we can make money out of this film. If a film is not done well, let's give it for silver extraction. Let's put it in the go down. I don't think there was an awareness in people because one of the crucial factors in India has been that the films have been not looked upon as an art form. We have suffered heavily upon that. Films have been looked upon as an entertainment, as, as something which is cheap entertainment, providing entertaining to a lower strata of people, people with low IQs. That's why you had a lot of frivolous films also coming up. And this mindset is a very interesting factor that Gandhiji never really cared for films. And I, I chanced upon a letter by one of the great script writers and, and uh, a great writer who I admired deeply, Khwaja Ahmed Abbas, K. Abbas, as he knows. K. Abbas was the writer for many of the Raj Kapoor films, like Avara. But also, he, he became famous because he made the first film with Amitabh Bachchan, Saath Hindustani, which he directed. A man from Ipta uh, with, 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 with left leanings, somebody who was a major factor in right from the 50s to the 70s. Uh, he wrote an open letter to Gandhiji. And uh, he very clearly said that, that what you regard as an evil is perhaps something which you've not been exposed to, the kind of cinema like Nietzsche Nagar and other films which are, which are talking about realism and socialistic issues and other things. Probably he was seeing some frivolous films which, which made up his mind that cinema has to be looked upon as a social evil like gambling, satyabazi, or horse trading, or horse racing, all kinds of things. And Abbas was, was trying his best that cinema be recognized as an art form. And I think, I think the social stigma which, which got into cinema started from that period that Gandhiji absolutely didn't budge. And if you look at the constitution also, and if you look at the state list, because cinema is a state subject, uh, you would find that cinema is regarded not as an art form like music and paintings and other forms, even though cinema has evolved out of that. I mean, you look at Dasa Falke, who was he? He was a painter, he was a photographer, he was a poet, he was an artist. Babur or painter, who was he? Another artist. So, so film imbibes 
all the forms of art. Still, we don't think of it as an art. And over the period, because of certain kinds of films, it had a lot of entertainment value. So I think producers thought the best way is that if we can extract silver or or bang or, or sell it for bangles, if the film is done well, fine. If the film hasn't done well, let's just give it for silver. So at least we'll get something out of it. And I think because of that, we lost so much of our heritage that it became virtually that by the time the National Film Archive was established, uh, we had lost nearly 70 to 80 percent of our heritage. I think one of the one of the biggest problems of of preserving the films has been and what we've been advocating. Uh, we started the Film Heritage Foundation in 2014. And, and the main idea of that time was that, that the need for every state to have an archive of its own. The fact that you are relying on just one institution in Pune uh, to preserve the heritage which are producing 2,000 films. You can imagine which institution in the world can, can alone single-handedly catalog, manage, preserve so many avenues of cinema. And that is why Film Heritage Foundation was formed to, to sort of strengthen the aspect of preservation. And, and the whole idea is to have far more archives because we don't have a national policy on archives. One of the things which we lack is that apart from we regarding cinema as an art form, which we are, which Film Edit Foundation is fighting now to find to, to find a way to get it into the constitution, but also to have a national policy towards film preservation. Then why should there be a struggle? Cinema has, after all, been the most important part of our lives in India. I mean, cinema and cricket were two most important aspects of our lives. I mean, this talk is happening from Hyderabad. Uh, and I know all the stories from the Telugu industry that people would would uh, would prefer to go and see a film than eat, and and that was the madness of films. I mean, you had stars like Nageshwar Rao and uh, N. T. Rama Rao. Uh, you had Shivaji Ganeshan and M. G. R. And uh, you know now today you have Chiranjeevi and, and Rajinikanth and so many big stars from the south, and still. It was a shame that many of the superstars went on to become chief ministers of their states, but they did very little towards preserving their own heritage. And uh, when we came on the scene, things were really in its, I would say, in a bad way. We didn't know where to start because we were losing so much of our heritage uh, every day. And uh, it was it was my journey towards making celluloid man, which really awakened me it was it was a journey which sort of made me realize that that it's not just important to realize that how much is lost but you need to do something and we plunged ourselves to preserve films now there are two aspects about preservation itself if you really look at the preservation one is of course when you talk about celluloid preservation which is actually the films which were made before the 2014 and the other aspect is the digital preservation. Digital is what we are having today, a revolution of digital. Every form is on digital. The, the celluloid preservation was easy because what was remaining uh, is that because of the chemical ingredient in a, in a celluloid, the longevity of the celluloid was, was, was far longer than what the digital medium is. And if you really look at it, Lumiere Brothers shot a film in 1896, 1895, sorry. and it came to India in 1896. But 1895, you can still have those films scanned in a simple scanner and see the film. And the resolution, as tested by Prasad, and we had Christopher Nolan who came for an event, and we realized that the resolution of celluloid film is literally 24K. Now, if you look at digital today, your Netflix, your Amazon, or even the movie theaters, if you're going, the whole thing is about 4K. True. 
people talk about 4K. Uh, before that, it was 2K. Now 2K is going to go out. It's going to be 4K. And later, it's going to be 6K, 8K. But celluloid is still giving you 24K. So the imageries of celluloid is so important that you preserve the original camera negative of a film. And if you don't have an original camera negative, you preserve the next bits, which is dupe negative, master positive, print, sound negative, whatever the elements of films are. As far as digital is concerned, the big problem in digital is that it's always changing. You know, it's like your iPhone. Nobody is happy for you to live with the iPhone for more than six months. Apple is going to come out with another iPhone. And all the kids, all the young people are going to go to their parents and say, Dad, I want to buy the new iPhone. So today is iPhone 10. Today has become an iPhone 11, iPhone 12. Uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, most of you today in the lockdown are exposed to many, many lockdown films. And uh, let me talk about some of the popular films which Mr. Bachchan was involved in, or the one with Prasun Pandey, with a whole lot of stars. It was one of the first lockdown films. The criteria is that you've got to have an Apple iPhone 11, because that gives you the best quality. So if you have a lesser phone, no, that's not allowed. So, so iPhone 11. So what they've done is, basically, that all the earlier formats become redundant. And that's what I was trying to tell you, that you can take a Lumia film, Louis Lumiere's film, or you can take Raja Harichandra of Falki, which is 1913. You can go to a scanner and scan it. And, and you will need to keep scanning it as the time goes. But the, but the, the storage of the resolution or the actual film is so valuable in the gold, while your digital is constantly changing. So when the Academy, which is the Oscar Academy, when they were asked to prepare a report, on, and you had built, built, built Mr. Milton, yeah, built, he was there. He was part of your incredible uh, journey of, of actually discovering the whole concept of digital dilemma, the report which they came up. And that report clearly, clearly sort of says that digital is something unknown. It's like the coronavirus, you know. It's like the coronavirus that it just keeps, you just keep discovering, you don't know where you're going to hit. You don't know where the end is going to be. It just flooded, 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 flooded with, with images and with videos and um, and I call it the virus because, because a lot of trash, a lot of negativity and a lot of things which is, is exposing to uh, and, and many times not very constructive. But in terms of preservation, look at the challenge it has for the conservators and preservers, what to preserve and what not to preserve, because the amount of digital material which is thrown onto you. Uh, I had the statistics. I, I, I don't want to you know, just give you statistics because they've become numbers um, and they have no consequence in that sense. But the fact is that these numbers are mind-boggling because, because they, they just don't tell you whether that particular digital data is relevant from a year from now or do you have to keep migrating. And that is why in digital they've come up with saying that the hard drive and we had prepared a chart to show you the longevity of different mediums in from the celluloid to what today the digital medium, what are the different longevities of, of each one of them? And it's quite sad and shocking that if you look at it, that hard drive can last you only three to five years. And that also you're not sure because you need to back it up in two hard drives. And But the best form of preservation today is, is what is called LTO, linear tape open. Most of the studios, most of the filmmakers, producers, uh, most of the telecast broadcasters are using this this medium of its easy migratory aspects. LTO means linear tape open. 
and you're able to migrate your data at a more convenient way. Uh, but that also, there's a catch to it. What is interesting is that I've been always saying about the heavy consumerism, which, which we all live in. The LTOs have come out with their machines. So if you have saved everything on LTO 5, those machines don't exist today. So you'll have to migrate every time a new LTO comes so that, so look at the expenditure in digital. You have to undertake to continuously be in that process of preservation and what is called accessibility. So that you and I can access material from archives. In order to do that, a lot of people ask me, why don't you make all your material accessible? Do you know the cost of what it means to do a digitization project? It is such an expensive proposition. It's not easy. All archives, all museums cannot just sit down and, and make everything accessible because it costs a lot of money. There are, there are things which has to be undertaken and, and there are various things we can talk about that in a later extent. But the fact is today, while the need is become of digitization, because that's what every, every archive is thriving on and saying during this pandemic, how do we survive is through digitization projects. And one of the big drawbacks in India has been that very few archives and museums have really digitized their material have been able to make it accessible to people, to, to, to a common person, to be able to access uh, some of the data or some of the materials they would like to hear during this time. Uh, you have a lot of online platforms now showing uh, world-class films, festivals. Uh, people are coming with innovative ideas about that. But having said that, it's not easy to set up a digitization program. And there's a methodology, there is a proper way to do it. And with that methodology, you have to find ways of how to preserve it for the future generation, because that is something which, which every museum and every archive has to look into. Now, the third aspect which I wanted to talk about was, was restoration. Um, people use the term restoration for anything and everything. They think, Sitting at home, I've tweaked a bit of sound, it's become restoration. I've played with my music, bit, bit, bit with the music. I've got, a, I've got a comp, so I've worked on the bit of the color, I've done the restoration. Now, what does restoration actually mean? By restoration, we actually mean that if you, let me explain to you, not in terms of film, but in terms of uh, a monument. If you look at the Taj, uh, the Taj Mahal of Agra, beautiful, and I am giving that example because I remember many years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, when Mayavati was the chief minister, there were, Taj Mahal has those minarets, four minarets, and a few of the marbles of those minarets had fallen or broken or whatever. And I saw the pictures where the person in charge said, we've got better marble than what Shah Jahan had put. <laughs> and we have put it there. And suddenly when I was seeing the pictures, and I said, but that marble is looking different than that, that marble. I mean, if you walk in that area, you will suddenly feel it's, it's looking odd. Suddenly those marbles were were looking out of place or they may be shining more or what it was because I never saw it physically. I saw it on pictures and uh, some, and there was a whole outcry. This was the time when Mayavati was planning across the Yamuna to start a mall opposite the Taj and there was a bit controversy there also. Um, but I think a lot of conservators and things, there was an outcry, there was a bit of a thing and suddenly they sourced that this came, these marbles came from very close to Mandu because Shah Jahan had traveled 
with his vice, Mumtaz Beg. And on that journey back, she had died, if you, if you remember the history. And he had found the Karigars from there. And I went and visited that much later after the story with my father, uh, where these marbles came from and what was what was unique about it now. And the, the, the few conservators said, we have to get that very marble which Shah Jahan had used so that it matches. It's not about good or bad. It's about the originality of the material. So when you look at a film, and you think about a film, you don't make it better than what it was released in the 70s. You, you've got to look at, this is Sholay. It was shot in this particular way. What was the period? What was the color time when it was released? And how am I going to make it look exactly the same? I don't make it look better or recolor it or repolish it. It's like saying, that a Van Gogh's painting of sunflower, the yellow painting, I have now got, you know, I've seen it enough times. Can we just make it blue? So what with Van Gogh did it? We've got better artists today. They can make it better than that. So restoration means research. It means investigative. It means talking to people who were involved with the film that time. If you have a DOP or a cameraman or a technician surviving, bring him along and then have a colorist, have technicians who understand what restoration is. Don't give the film to a new age kid who is only interested in making it an HD quality. And, and just because everything is 4K, the fact that if early films had a bit of grains, you've got to keep the grains. If that film was shot on black and white, you don't make it color like Mughle Azam because that was not Kiyasim's vision. If the aspect ratio of the film was 1.33 like a TV, which was which was like a like a square box, then you leave it there. You don't make it HD like the way you want it today to see it. Because after you what you create today, 50 years from now, there may be some other format. They're not going to change that because you've shot with whichever format keeping your framing in mind. So I think restoration was highly misused and it continues to be misused in India. We don't have respect for the past. We don't have respect for the present also. And, uh, and I think it's high time we realize that, that restoration has to be an art form, like what I explained the Taj we will be able to restore films. And if you really look at the numbers of restoration in India, world-class restoration, they're just a handful of five or six films. And it is shocking. A lot of companies, a lot of people talk about restoration, but that's not really restoration. That's what is called, they have scanned the film. Scanning doesn't mean restoration. Once you scan, you just correct a bit of it. It doesn't mean restoration. Restoration begins with the physical restoration of the film itself. And, 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 and it's a long procedure which needs to follow. The last point which, uh, uh, which I was very keen to, to touch upon, which I touched in the beginning, was, was surviving the pandemic um, for all the museums and archives today. I think everybody is, is, is worried about what the future is. Uh, everybody's worried about that. Will we be able to step out and go to a museum uh, or watch a film again or go to the theater? Uh, let me, let me give you some of the most, uh, most uh, inspirational stories. Or let, or let me talk about what is really happening around the world. I mean, we know that France is opening all their museums in July. But more importantly, Christopher Nolan is completing his film, Tenet, uh, which is going to hit the theaters in July. Also, July 18th is the date. It might get pushed. I'm not sure. But Christopher Nolan, uh, whom I know very well, uh, is absolutely clear that his film has to be watched on theater. Now, when you look at 
all the pandemics. I want to give you a personal experience of mine. My great grandfather, Marabal Vijay Vijay Singh, was the ruler of Dungarpur, and he had sent his soldiers to fight the World War One, and they they came back, and when they came back, he went to the barracks to meet them, and apparently he got Spanish flu. And at the age of 31, he passed away. My great grandmother wrote a diary, uh, and the diary was very interesting, which was written. And she was from a place called Selana. Selana is in Madhya Pradesh, and is known for its food. and And she was she was self educated, and she wrote a diary that she sees the future very bleak. she doesn't see human beings ever stepping out of their homes because even in that time uh florence nightingale you know she had died by by 1918 but of course her whole advent and her whole thoughts was about washing your hands maintaining social distancing in a way uh, they didn't have the mask but they were covering themselves but they were washing their hands for the whole concept of florence nightingale washing your hands but people were told to stay indoors and when you read the diaries you really felt that the world is coming to an end and just see 1990 the world changed completely everything was back as if nothing had really happened people forgot about the history of 1980 and i was speaking to my father and i said did your grandmother ever tell you about 1980 she said she never ever brought up that subject because it was forgotten so i think human mankind or you you man or, or, or we as a human race have the ability to just come back all the times and what is created that personal experience of watching a film personal experience of going to a museum is is going to remain that is something which i think no online or no webinar or no social distancing as what we are calling it is going to work uh, till the human race survives in this, in this world but people who have their archives and their museums the only way to preserve it is 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 to find a way to go to your museum and archive uh, just once in a while and to check the conditions check the reports uh, even if one of you can go just to see how your material is preserved i think that's the only thing we can do lastly i think india's heritage is so vast and so so amazing i think what is remaining we all need to pledge to support it to save it and make it a make it available for the next generation because it's as important as saving the human race is also saving what the human race created so we need to save both the human race and its creation thank you thank you so much uh, shivan ji for such an enriching talk yeah you rightly said you know saving cinema is as important as the you know saving human race uh, i have couple of questions to you you know uh, you have been basically a trained filmmaker from you know such a prestigious institute pune film institute and then you finally you know into the world of you know uh, film preservation and the, and the archive so how did you know what triggered you to become the you know film preservationist and uh, film archivist yeah actually i i'm still a filmmaker because i make my own films uh i don't make the commercial lot of films so i make what what interests me uh, but also i run a very successful ad ad film making i've made i've directed over 800 commercials 800 films about ad films so i constantly making films i think the inspiration came from scorsese uh, who's been a big supporter of mine big supporter of the foundation uh, and if you really look at it he is a filmmaker but he also heads a foundation his foundation is called the film foundation and uh, i think 
the responsibility of every filmmaker is that the filmmakers we have seen and we have been inspired how not only their work but our works will survive the next generation. And I think when you when when I when I decided to make Celluloid Man, that was that was that was something which grew out of my uh, trip to Bologna, uh, which thanks to Scorsese, where I went there and I was able to see uh, how films were were preserved and how they were showcased and how they were restored so beautifully and that made me go back to Pune and think about because as a filmmaker you know you're so busy with your craft that you forget uh, you forget actually uh, what uh, is going to happen to your work after you have made it you move on to an next project and that's what the real problem in India has been that everybody just moved on without really caring and, and in the West you had Scorsese, Coppola, uh, Spielberg, Christopher Nolan, uh, Alexander Payne, you know, all the great filmmakers who, who started, who got together, became part of the Film Foundation and said, it's not only important to, to make film, but it's important to preserve. So I think it's, it's something that I didn't move on to. It's an extension of filmmaking. And uh, when I went to meet Nayasad in Pune, um, which actually I was so aggravated at that time because I saw the conditions of the National Film Archive. I was very upset about it. And, and, and that got inspired of my traveling all over India to figure out what is really the issue of films, films which we are crazy about, you know. We all grew up crazy about films. And, and, and if you don't have some of the films you love, they don't exist. What are you going to do? And, and that journey actually changed my view of life. It was like a Gandhi's journey on to finding his own country and deciding to start freeing India. It was my journey, cinema journey to all over, in fact, all over India to really find what is lost and what needs to be done. And I think the foundation grew out of that. But in, foundation is an extension of my filmmaking. And if you look at my latest film, which is Checkmate in Search of Iji Menzel. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a seven hour long film. Uh, it has a lot of footages also. It deals with the Czech New Wave, one of the most important movements in the history of cinema, which inspired so many Indians. I mean, Kund I remember Kundan Shah, Basu Chatterjee, the whole lot of 70s New Wave filmmakers telling me that it was the Czech filmmakers which inspired me. And, and if I have to look back at that, it was my education at the FTIR where I saw those films, which Nayasar showed us, which made me travel to Prague for eight years. I was making this film, which is finally releasing on a Blu-ray uh, on July 13th in London. Second run DVD releasing it. If you go to our Facebook, check mate in search of A. Menzel or Jerry Menzel, as we call him, you can you can check out the release of the film. So. Again, something which I've used out of archiving is, is the number of clips and number of footage which I've used, uh, not only from India, but, but from Czechoslovakia, from England, from USA. So it just goes that, that filmmaking and archiving is sort of part of the same thing. It just depends on certain filmmakers, how interested and passionate they are. To, to me, I can't see them segregated and I always think about uh, preservation as equal important as archive, as, as filmmaking. Sorry. Okay. So, so you, we all look forward to your new film, uh, Checkmate. I'm sure you know, it's going to be an interesting film. Uh, now we have you know, a couple of questions from audience as well. Uh, first of all, Ajit Rai, he says, welcome Shivan Singh Dugarpur, your film on PK Nair was super. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you very much. Uh, then you have, yeah, yeah, you want, you were saying something. You know, I never thought I'll make a film. It, again, it was a journey, and uh, I had to complete it. It was never none of my films are ever thought as as films. They evolve, and that is what I like about myself. In that sense, is that I like to keep myself organic. I never like to have a beginning or an end. I don't believe in that concept of beginning and end. 
you get inspired, you, you move along, you, something conceives, uh, what, what comes out of it, as time only tells you, and, and, and then organically you just say, okay, this is fine, now let's leave it here. Duration never matters to me. In order to do this, you have to work not in the commercial streams. Uh, when you work in the commercial streams, uh, which I do when I make my ad films, the restraints are of different kind. People telling you, have a beginning, have an end, have a middle, uh, have this, have that. And I think I like to refrain myself from that. That's important as an artist, uh, how you free yourself uh, all the time, because that's what keeps you going. And that's what you know makes your films very, very interesting, you know, and then celluloid men, especially reveals to be classic, you know, especially for the film students and the other viewers as well. Uh, now, we have uh, another question from Mr. Siddiq Azad. He says, uh, the students who just passed out, how can he or she start a career in film industry? Where and how they will get an internship? Yeah, I, I think, I think, Pilvanji, this is a very important question, which, which Mr. Siddiqui has raised. Uh, I get a lot of mails from people asking me to intern with them. Uh, and I was thinking about a whole lot of students who are finishing, whether it's from FTI or from various film schools, you know, across India. Because yeah. when I was a student, there was only FTI. Or, and no, so sorry, there was Adyar also. Adyar had a film school Adyar. in, in Chennai. But there wasn't uh, so many film schools. Now, uh, not only film schools, but media schools or whatever you call them. In Hyderabad itself, you have so many of them. Um, so I think at this moment, because no internship can be done through online. Because that kind of internship is, 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 is not internship. Internship, at least in the media or in the filmmaking, there, is, there has to be a, a physicality to it. There has to be, because how do you, how do you get inspired is when you, when you step up or when you, when you move out. You are in a circle. It's like saying, I'll do the entire education of kids through online. The kid will never grow up because, because he must have a problem with his best friend. It's, it's, it's a community. It's a struggle. It's, it's a friendship. It, it's, it's those relationships which are important, which you formulate in the school. that can never get evolved through an online medium. So having said that, I think most people are very unsure at this moment of what is opening and what is not opening. Uh, Maharashtra hasn't opened up. Tel Telangana hasn't opened up as far as the film. There's a lot of dialogue happening. A lot of committees have been formed, which is discussing the various ways of people to shoot or intern or think. People at this moment are going to take a little precautionary measure of having more and more people in their unit. But it is only a temporary solution. I think by the time of July, uh, it would be very easy. Uh, more and more people will open out and you could write to various people. I'm always open to take interns, but I can also refer Advanji to various people. Uh, if you want, we can have a separate dialogue with Advanji for a lot of people whom you would like to recommend, I could help uh, in recommending a lot of people to people who want to intern in Hyderabad because many of you may not want to travel all the way to Bombay, people who want to intern in different portions. What needs to be done is, and which is what we can do, and I think somewhere in Ranji, if we can all formulate this thing, that we get the FTI director on board, we get other institutions on board, that I can help to set up where the students are, the very place itself, talk to various institutions or directors or whoever they would like to work with and speak to them and see what the possibilities are. So I think we can work that system. Uh, it's not going to be difficult. And uh, if we work constructively together, uh, I can certainly help Mr. Siddiqui and other students who will be very worried about losing time. Uh, but People who want to be young filmmakers, people who want to uh, who want to follow the media line, I would only advise you 
watch a lot of films, read a lot, and and inspire yourself. If you read Kurosawa, something like an autobiography, uh, he writes in his last few pages that every day he would write a page about a script or a thought. Uh, so write that. Uh, when you are when things open, I think it will be very easy that you are well read, you are well educated, and you are also seen a lot of films which will help you in your growth as a filmmaker. To that, to that. Adi Siddiq Azad, uh, this question is well answered, uh, um, and it's a great thought from uh, Shivan Singh Dugarpur's side that you know we should have some forum, and you know we can surely take take this forward now. Uh, now we have another question from uh, Mr. Saurabh Gwalifa. He has two questions, very interesting questions. He has. He says so his first question is: Hi sir, our cinematic culture has largely overlooked subjects such as restoration, archiving, preservation. We hardly get to hear of Mr. P. K. Nair sir, and there is just too little info about the others who helped uh, who helped archiving effort in past, such as B. D. Garga. And what about them? Can we really help to nurture a culture of archiving and preservation without simultaneously building and without simultaneously building an archive of those uh, intact healthy movement? No, I agree with you because you see, unfortunately, when we, I mean, Pekinair was, I mean, celluloid man was was the turning point for Pekinair also uh, because not only did did it bring a lot of lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, not been, I mean, not a lot of uh, fame to me because of that thing, but also it brought Nayasab into a limelight, and he started being called. You know, he was sort of neglected because even I, as, as a person who landed up in Pune, never thought of Nayasab. We we knew him as, in the institute, but you know, once you finish from your colleges, it's like officer and a gentleman. You you sort of forget, and then you find him just outside the NFAI. Still living, retired in a small quarter, even though he has a beautiful house in in Chennai. So people like Nayasa is is unique. Uh, we try and keep him and his memories alive. We've got all his material and his work. As far as B D Garga is concerned, Indira Gandhi National Centre for Arts has got all the B D Garga material. There has been a movement by various people to to make his archive online. Uh, if you even go to see Wershing archive, they've been also Joseph Wershing, who was the cameraman for all the Bombay Talkies films. They're making online. Yes, the pandemic has actually sh shifted our focus now that we need to really start thinking about having online archives of these people. Mm. And, and and I think that is going to be the next uh, crucial part for for the archives which are going to survive. The first hurdle right now is how do we survive this pandemic? Because we haven't still seen the effect of those three months because it's going to last for a long time. But once we survive, uh, I think the focus is going to be uh, is how to how to digitally, you know, make it available, online access, uh, and 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 a lot needs to be done about the future archives. In fact, we have a project which we. We we, are, we internally have a project of which a lot of our people. Uh, there's not only Dr. B. D. Garga. There's Abdul Ali. Uh, he was a famous collector, and he also was responsible for saving a lot of films in Bombay. Uh, so many such people's material are with us. We are we are hoping that all that could be made online. Yes, yeah. Great. I'm sure Saurabh, this question is uh, well answered. Saurabh has another question. Uh, right uh, from 1986, uh, from Hollywood's first feature length in Kelly's Gang to uh, 1970s, Ghat Shraddha by Grish Kasavali, we see iconic films left to decay in oblivion. But with the excessive commercialization and digitization, there is a demand for the legacy films once again. Do you think such commercialization can only singularly help archiving and preservation? Because we still don't really don't we we don't really see much demand from the movie buyers for silent era and legacy cinema. No, uh, sort of, I don't agree with that. But yes, see, I have been propagating one aspect, which is which is what we lack. If you look at US, they have a thing called Criterion Channel. Now, what does Criterion Channel do? Or they have what is another TV channel 
they have not only HBO, but they had uh, what was it called? I'm forgetting the name of the channel. But they were showing all the old classic films, and Criterion also is showing classic films, but nicely restored and shown. Now, if you look at India, there's not a single platform which is restoring and showing them. You have this horrible YouTube, which which half the films you don't feel like watching because they're in such bad shape. So there's not a single platform which is available for the Indian audience. And once you show them, then they will like to see. I mean, you know, you you got you got to build your silent film, and that is what the NFAI should be doing because they have all the silent films. They should provide, restore them, and provide online access to them. So, so that I'm sure the NFAI would be thinking about this, uh, and they would be working on. You know, everybody is thinking during this pandemic about these issues. But apart from those silent era films, I think the whole history of Indian cinema, if you really look at it, I mean, I want to see Nasir Hussain films. I want to see Goldie Anand films. Where do I see it? I don't have any platform to see it. Neither do I have good negatives of it. Neither do I have platform because nobody has cared. Nobody has cared to look after these films. True that. Uh, so uh, we have, you know, uh, two questions related to the, you know, courses on uh, preservation. Uh, first question is from Mr. Sakil Ahmad. He says, sir, do you have any plan to introduce uh, film archive courses, at least one subject studies in postgraduate or master's, something like that, because they don't have, they don't see much course on the film preservation. Yeah. Shakil, we, we did five film preservation workshops, major workshops. Uh, if you go to our Film Heritage Foundation, website or our Film Heritage Foundation Facebook, you will see that we've conducted uh, and Rizwan Sahib was also part of the last workshop which we did in Hyderabad. So we have conducted major workshops on film preservation and restoration and we do it every year. Uh, but, you know, we were in talks. It's a very interesting question you put. We were in talks and we want to start a course and I, we were looking forward for this year to set things aside um, and to have a regular course at university level on film preservation because and also our entire course on online also. So people who cannot benefit out of that because because this is the preservation workshops is something which Film Heritage Foundation has very uniquely created and it's a very unique territory of Film Heritage Foundation and we, we really last fifth year, the kind of faculty we had, the kind of people, the students, it was a great community and a great number of people who came together. So the idea was that how do you make it accessible to a larger kind of people who can do online courses. Film Heritage Foundation can provide online courses, online certificates of a certain kind of. So, yeah, so that's going to be our goal. We were hoping but the pandemic came and now I have to wait for things to settle so that we can we can begin again. So Mr. Shakil Ahmad, you can expect a course soon actually after pandemic maybe. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Saurabh Goyal. He says earlier 8mm and 16mm films uh, were often used by the amateur and independent filmmakers which are now replaced by this economy of DSLRs. So is there a possibility that satellite will make a comeback at elementary filmmaking? Well, it's an interesting thing you brought up Super 8 or 8MM. A lot of people are shooting their lockdown films. I, I have been shooting my film. Uh, and uh, on Super 8. And just a minute, I'll bring I'll show you a Super 8 camera. Please, please. So this is the Super 8 film. Uh, camera which I'm shooting with, um, and uh, so I I put a 200. Say I can't open the film. The film film goes onto this Kodak, and you still get those films which I had. So I was able to shoot that. 
and this is how and you can vary your speeds uh, it, you want to shoot 24 frames uh, you want to shoot 16 frames how you want to shoot so uh, so sort of i uh, believe that it's it's the films is the individual artistic interpretation of how one wants to look at it i don't get excited too much by digital though i use digital medium also uh, so at present i shoot stills uh, with film and i'm also shooting on polaroid uh, i love the polaroid format uh, i was very inspired by uh, if you want to go and see robbie buller robbie buller was was the cameraman of wim benders right. and uh, he he has a book on polaroids and i was very inspired by a lot of polaroid even tarkovsky used to shoot a lot of polaroids so that inspired me and i and i'm a big fan of polaroids so i shoot a lot of polaroids um, polaroid films you can easily get so can films these films for uh, super 8 so so it all depends on you yeah, film everything is available it just depends uh, where you want to do it and if you want to process it yeah in india we don't have atm processing and the advantage is that i don't want to see what i shoot straight away so i have to wait for the film to get processed so that i can watch it and that might take a couple of months i'm ready to wait yeah great so saurav i think you could see the super 8 camera also today uh, i haven't seen you know in the sent past so i am lucky to see the super 8 camera today with uh, shivanji uh, Saurabh has, uh, you know, one more question. Uh, which Shakil Saab has uh, also asked. Such, uh, you know, uh, how do you envisage the future of film preservation studies and curriculum in India in post-COVID world? Uh, will we continue to will we continue to have, you know, FPRWI workshops and have an inclusive film preservation studies in uh, Indian universities going ahead? I think Chivanji has answered that question. Uh, no, already, yeah. Yes. So Siddiq Azad is uh, having a you know question. He says, sir, regarding the storytelling, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon techniques, how much uh, credible nowadays? <laughs> yeah. You see, Rashomon was from a book by Akutagawa, great writer, great Japanese writer. And if you read the original story, and I read that original story, and you can interpret that story in many ways. The, the whole idea of storytelling is the fascinating aspect of storytelling is that today also we we talk about homer we talk about Iliad, we talk about we talk about kalidas we talk about prehistoric we talk about arthashastra so so the inspiration from where storytelling aspect comes from uh, is is, is something which is going to remain ever. I mean, if people can make films or people can make thinking of making Ramayana or telecasting Ramayana and thousand people sitting apart from religious, something will be there to hold on to people. So I think whether it's Kurosawa's Rashomon and, 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 and Rashomon actually uh, has been, I, I don't remember a film recently, but they did adapted to a recent film where you see different people talking about different interpretations of the story. Um, so you can take the essence. You don't need to take the setting. That was Kurosawa's setting. So the setting could change. It's like Macbeth. It's like Shakespeare. Vishal Bhardwaj is not taking the setting of Shakespeare. He's taking the essence of Macbeth. And Macbeth has been made into so many settings. Everyone has adapted Macbeth. So, so, so literature is something which is which is what you take the essence of literature. It has been written, and storytelling will always remain. Today, also with with all the digital, the the idea of guftugu is 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 far larger than just sending a mail. Beyond the point, you want to meet somebody and talk. And I and I and I tell you a story right now. That somebody in London, they just allowed six people to meet. You know, they've just allowed, they've eased out, and they said six people can meet. And I read the comments of everybody, and they all said, We wanted to meet somebody. And I said, Who is this somebody? He says, Anybody, but we want to meet anybody, some human being. 
whom we can talk to in real life. So, the need for us to, to coexist with, with other people has to be done. Great. Uh, so, we have the you know, last comment of the day today. Saurabh Gyal, he says, delighted and thankful to see the Super 8, 8mm camera, sir. Uh, that's a sur pleasant surprise for all of us here. And Shakil Savi says, same thing, nice with Super 8 camera. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rizwanji. Thank you for inviting me. And and I Thank hope you, you all I have, I have last question of the day from my side, because this is going to be the really most interesting aspect uh, of, of the talk. Uh, you were involved, you know, in this prestigious project of Kalpna uh, with Martin Scorsese. So, how did this, you know, did this uh, project came to you? And you know, uh, can you please share some background of the project, you know, so that you know, future preservationists, you know, archivists, it will be beneficial for them. Kalpna was a very unique uh, aspect, actually. Uh, like I said, I was very inspired, and I moved to. Uh, I went to uh, to Bologna, and when I went to Bologna, I met the Scorsese Foundation. And uh, I was very moved by what I was seeing there and restored film. And I started thinking about P.K. Nair and I started thinking about, oh God, I started thinking, oh my God, in NFTI, we used to, you know, NFTI, we used to watch those films. And uh, there, when I met the foundation people, they said for two years, Scorsese has been wanting to restore Kalpana. And uh, he's not been able to find a headway. There has been no reply from the NFAI, there has been nobody corresponding and they're getting reports like this is the cinema of the Indian heritage, so we need to restore it. Totally disallowing the fact that there's a, there's a producer, there's a copyright holder who has the right over the film and, and, and the fact that somebody wants to put in the money, someone like Martin Scorsese, and to save the film, nobody was allowing it to move out. So I decided to, to, to park myself at the NFI. And I think it took about eight months of every uh, second day reaching up at NFI, harassing the people till finally they gave in. And I think one of the reasons they gave in at that time um, was, was the fact that I think they were fed up with me. They were fed up that I wanted this film to be restored. And Kalpana was sent for restoration uh, with great delight to Scorsese because if Ravi Shankar really wanted, because it was he who had suggested Pandit Ravi Shankar that let's restore, you know, it would have just needed a phone call from him. But he didn't want to interfere with the bureaucracy and he didn't want to interfere with the system. And he said, let it find its own course. But that eight months of my struggle to get Kalpana to be restored because in back of my mind yeah, that time I had not thought of the foundation but the back of my mind Rizmanji, was that if Kalpana gets restored it will lead to far more one the attention it will get from the international thing which it did because it was going to be screened at cards and Indian heritage would be saved there would be more attention towards the India's cinematic heritage and suddenly people will start talking about preservation and and i think that's what we are really proud of the fact that we in the foundation and we brought the attention of film preservation till then people didn't even know film preservation existed uh, everything was forgotten it was lying but today when people talk about film preservation they talk about that there is a thing called film preservation and there could be a, even a subject called film preservation i think it was a lot of struggle we had with the system of bringing it the awareness through projects like Kalpana, Celluloid Man, uh, and setting up the foundation. Thank you for you know sharing this story of Kalpana Shivanji. And with Thank this, you. Uh, we, now, we now come to the end of this session. It's been such a fascinating and you know enriching session, you know, to all of us. Uh, you you are a wonderful speaker, you know, in the way you covered the you know, whole aspect of the Indian cinema heritage, preservation and archive. I'm sure this is going to benefit the audience a lot. Uh, I, I really thank you from bottom of my heart, you know, from your busy schedule, you have taken out, you know, at least one and a half hour to us. Uh, it's, it's really going to benefit, you know, uh, the, the audience a lot. So I thank you, Shivanji, for joining us today. It's been wonderful talking to you today. It's been such an honor, you know, join you joined today. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rizwanji. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please take care. Bye. Thank you. Uh, so with this, we come to the end of the session uh, of, of this show today. Uh, tomorrow uh, we have two shows uh, at eleven thirty, and another one is at three o'clock. So eleven thirty uh, will be joined by you know two national award winning filmmaker, Mr. Nandan Saxena and Kavita Bell. They'll be sharing their journey to the documentary filmmaking and many more. Uh, and three o'clock, you know, we will be joined by a, a very eminent uh, cinematographer from uh, Britain, uh, Mr. Dick Pop. He has been uh, you know nominated twice for the Oscar Award, so I'll recommend you know all of you should uh, attend both these sessions at 11:30 and 3 o'clock. You know these are going to be very very interesting session tomorrow. So till then, uh, I say goodbye to all of you. Please take care. Thank you so much for joining us today.